So this lady in 2001, 21 years ago, she paid 155,000 for that land, oceanfront in South Carolina. Guess how much she sold it to me? She sold it to me for 700 bucks. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of the Real Estate Investors Club podcast. I'm here today with a virtual land flipper, as you can see, Ray Zhang. And he's going to tell us a little bit about his business model today. He just told me he's in Florida. It's warmer in Florida than it is here in Montreal. How are you doing today, Ray? Good. How are you doing, Terry? I'm great. Yeah, so glad to be here. Tell me a little bit about the journey through life that has led you to be on my show today talking about virtual land flipping. Uh, it's been a long way. I tried uh, all different kind of uh, real estate uh, niches, uh, wholesaling houses, virtual wholesaling houses, apartments, you know, rentals. And uh, eventually I started to do land. And, uh, you know, even after I started to do land, <clears throat> there was like a three years um uh, uh you know exploration period right i want to know which you know niche fits me the best and this year we have uh very very well uh success or results um doing land virtually great so tell me did you have like a day job before you got into this what made you do the swip the switch to real estate uh, i never worked for anyone besides my first job uh, i was a tour guide in um like a park and uh, and i was so tired of it um and then i started to flip cars um when i was in the job and uh, i fired my boss the f the first day i i i sold my car you know the first car i still remember what he said he said uh, just go back there and grab your stuff right he didn't really care at all so you know if you work for someone uh they probably care but you know not as much as your own future so Mm -hmm. And then how do you go from flipping cars to flipping buildings? Uh, you know, I was uh, just got some uh, savings. I was like, you know, I look at those real estate guys and they make a whole bunch of money. Uh, at least they say they, are, they did, right? And uh, I was like, they make one house deal that was 20 cars I have to sell to equal their, their profit. Um, you know, I... I I thought, you know, I have to level up my game. So that's when I started to try real estate and it won't work for like a couple of years at the beginning. So. Mm -hmm. And how long yeah. ago was that? Uh, I started to try about nine years ago. So I started to have some success in land about three and a half years ago. So during this six years, I've been trying and, uh, you know, just uh, trying different stuff, houses, apartments, everything, you name it. So. And that's all in Florida or is it kind of across the States? Uh, I was living in Hawaii. Uh, so, you know, virtual wholesaling or wholesaling houses was uh, fairly harder there. Um, if I was in the mainland, I would have made it work. And so you've moved now? Yeah, I'm right now in Florida. I moved here about uh, a year ago. Okay. Not too long, yeah. So tell me about your business model. How do you find the land? Uh, how much does it cost? How do you flip it? Just tell me how the whole thing fits together. Okay, so uh, my strategy fits more like a donut strategy. So I pick a very hot market like uh, Denver or Austin, Texas or uh, Dallas. Um, and then I start to market to the land nearby that hot market. I never go into that hot market because, you know, a lot of competition there and you cannot get a very good deal. But those areas surrounding that hot market is where I target to. And then I buy those land of uh, 30 or 40 cents on the dollar. Uh, and uh, after I bought it, I put it back on the MLS by a realtor. So I sold it back to the market about 90% uh, of the value. So uh, my is the uh, cheapest in the whole market. And uh, I try to make it quicker, you know, if there is a sale, that'll be me because I'm the cheapest in the entire area. Yeah, that's all come back to how much you, you start to buy them, right? So, and then how do you find that land at 30, 40 cents on the dollar? I, I mail it to everyone, every landowner in the entire area. 
And uh, so my motto is I offer them 40% on the dollar and uh, they either agree or tear it up, right? So if they tear it up, I never heard about, never heard from, from them. But if they call me back, I negotiate on top of that. So that's kind of like a double kill and uh, get a super good deal. Uh, and then I can sell it back um, maybe 90 cents on the dollar. So. And how do you, like, what's your success rate? I mean, I can't imagine that you're getting a lot of phone calls. Like, what's your conversion rate for that kind of thing? Uh, I don't have a specific rate because every market is different. But whoever call me, I could possibly get a deal. Uh, because I, I have done hundreds of land deals so far. I have never paid the original offer price ever. So it's always something off, you know, at that original price. Uh, there are some, the crazy ones is um, um, I offer for 22,000 and I end up buying for a couple hundred. And I uh, got two land for free this year. I sold it for 24,000 total. So it just, uh, how do you say that normally? And you really listen to the seller and see what's, what's their need. Right. And then, you know, it kind of say different things. It depends on their needs. Mm -hmm. You're yeah. making this sound too easy. And I want to <laughs> know, I want no, but I want to know like, like, okay, so tomorrow I'm just gonna, what, like canvas the whole, you know, sub, like, I guess what, beyond the suburbs of Denver or something, make sure that I find the names and phone, not phone numbers of addresses of those people. Like, how do you make this work? Cause you're making it sound too easy. Yeah, so I first of all I look at the sold data. So whoever uh, sold the uh, land, there is uh, data there, right? So I want to see exactly what that subdivision subdivision belong to. And uh, so let's say this land sold uh, last week for what price in that subdivision A, right? And then I will target the entire subdivision for about forty percent of that sold price. Either is range about 40 to 55%. And if there's a hot market like Denver, I would jump to 50%, right? So if I go back to Florida or Texas, I would do about 45%. So I offer about 40% of the entire subdivision. And whoever calls me, you know, they they know I'm not paying the, the market price. So when they call back, they don't expect you to pay the, the full price the full value of the land right so they either don't know how much their land is worth or they have some situation they need money and uh, either way i can uh you know can try to convince them to sell me for lower price but i don't really push them i pull back uh just pretending i don't want to buy that land and see how much the best they can do mm -hmm. yeah and so do you do this all yourself or do you have like some kind of a CRM or like some a virtual assistance or what's your, what does your team look like? Yeah, I have a uh, one virtual assistant and uh, I pay him uh, $2 an hour. Not too much. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> just, I just signed him a couple hundred today to just for, you know, Christmas. Right. Uh, but uh, normally I would just pay him $2 an hour and he, re he was really happy about that price. Uh, but you know, you never know, right. When you find a virtual assistant. So he's the only employee I have, uh, uh, he helped me send out the offers. And, uh, then when the offer comes back, I talk the seller myself, uh, about two to three hours a day on the phone. Uh, and after I got the, the deal, I'll send it to the title company to close it. And they go from there, the title company was call the seller and make sure the deal went through uh, smooth. And after it transferred to my name, I would send it to the, the realtor to post it for me and uh, list it for sale. So on the selling side, I don't even need to worry about it. You know, so you just give it to the realtor and forget it. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really, uh, like, it's a very interesting niche. I don't, you know, yeah. don't talk to too many people who um, do those kind of transactions. And I'm still, I guess I'm still trying to get a sense for, let's say I want to try to do this tomorrow. Like, mm -hmm. what do I, what do I do tomorrow morning to set up this kind of business for myself? Uh, first of all, you need to know the data, what happened in the last three months in the county you chose. So I divide my, my, um, steps into six steps, right? There's the first step is market selection. You have to find a market that uh, you know that you can do business there. So the key indicator is uh, you have to have at least 40 sold in that county in the last three months for land alone, right? 
And uh, that's the first part, right? The second part is how to make offers. So we make offers about 40% of the sold price in the same subdivision, not the same county, same subdivision, right? So, and then I send the offer out that, you know, all the males is like your little armies, right? They kill all the non-motivated non, non sellers and uh, they, you know, bring back all the motivated sellers. They call me back. I know how much the value of the land in about five minutes. So that's the third step, which is uh, a land evaluation. You have to know how much that land is worth under five minutes, right? So on the phone with the seller. And the, the fourth step is negotiation. So you talk to the seller, uh, you help them, you listen, and then try to get a lower price than the offer price. So after that, it just, um, you know, you, you, you acquire the land, uh, you, you know, close it with the title and sell it with the realtor. So that's six steps total. And, uh, you know, very easy. You don't have to spend a lot of time on this business because, you know, there's nothing to talk about on land, right? There's just dirt. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and numbers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Very interesting. Have you really been listening to the episode or has your monkey mind been taking you off in one direction or another? Our mental habits can be our biggest assets or our biggest liabilities as we pursue certain goals. For me, the biggest performance gains have always come from training my mind. In my book, Mindful Landlord, I talk about how you can train your mind and how you can apply some of these strategies to your journey in the real estate field. The book is available on Amazon and also on its website, mindfullandlord.com. And now I'll stop evangelizing for the power of mental training and let you get back to the show. So I want to now move to like some kind of not specifically business model questions that I, I like to ask my guests. So um, I think one of the things that I don't like in the real estate industry is that very often, you know, you look at people's Instagram feeds and what they're putting out in public, you see like all the wins and you see kind of a celebration of this like ball in lifestyle. And when the actual truth is that all of us who, you know, have reached some level of success have done it with some kind of sacrifice. So whether that's a time sacrifice, a lifestyle sacrifice, a security sacrifice, what do you feel like your the hits were that you took in delaying gratification to get your business off the ground? Yeah, my my mentor Tom Curl always tell me uh, the number two rule of business is everyone is full of poop, right? So uh, they all post different things on Instagram and to try to show off, but the uh, re reality uh, there is a lot of hard works behind the scene and people don't see and they see this uh, business so shiny and you know there's always a shiny shinier project right when you do something this business you know that you're not doing right now is always uh, quicker to get the money and that the amount of money is always bigger right so that's called shiny object well, whatever you do you will run into that shiny object and uh, but for land uh, i would say this is the opportunity Right, if believe it or not, land is very easier to for, compared to houses. There is absolutely nothing on top of it. You don't need to worry about the toilet or the wall falling down. Right, so the land is is about uh, the opportunity about in ten years ago for houses. So, um, but everyone right now start to kind of realize the value of the land right now. Uh, but I was uh, I would assume about ten years later, land will be as popular as houses. But, uh, you know, behind the scene, I have to call uh, people. You have to follow up uh, just exactly what you do with houses, but much easier uh, to talk about land with a seller. Because uh, just think about it. Uh, the seller do not have emotion attached to a piece of dirt. They have emotion attached to a house. So if you try to negotiate a house for 40 percent, I, I would say good luck to you. Right. So um, but with land. People have not only they do, don't have the the positive emotion to the land, and sometimes they have negative emotion to land uh, because you know they let's say you are you bought the land in Florida, you plan to move there after retirement, and all of a sudden you move to Montreal, and then and then all this uh, dirt or or the weeds grow on the the land. Are you gonna fly here to just cut it? And uh, you might hire people to cut it, but what about the second time, the third time, the 10th time, 
right? So eventually you'll be super tired of it. And if you don't cut it, the city will give you a ticket. It's called nuisance lien, right? So uh, they give you a ticket, you have to pay, otherwise you lose the property. So sometimes when they call me, they're out of desperate, desperation. They want to get rid of it. Uh, I have a, a deal happened about two months ago. So this lady in 2001, 21 years ago, she paid 155000 for that land, oceanfront in South Carolina. Guess how much she sold it to me? She sold it to me for 700 bucks, And uh, I, was, I was shocked myself. But she said, whoever can close this fastest, I'll give it to, to that guy. I was like, I'm the fastest guy on the earth, you know, not not running, but I, as far as closing the deal. So I closed that. I closed that within a week. I got that land for 700. After close it, I asked her, why do you sell it for 700? You pay 155. And she said, um, because I want to take it as a tax loss for my company. And uh, I don't want to deal with that crap anymore. So that's what happened with land, right? Hmm. Sorry, it takes a long time. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I mean, it's, it's an interesting answer, but you didn't really tell me about what sort of, you know, sacrifices you had to make where you are in that particular kind of business. Maybe I can poke you again to just, yeah, you know, speak yeah, so, to that so a the, little bit. <laughs> the, the, the sacrifice is consistent. Uh, not looking all the shiny object, shiny objects. You have to call every day, and if there's people calling you, if they don't pick up and you call back, you have to follow up, right? So about three, at least about two to three hours, you have to call them back. And uh, there's another thing, it costs you money, which is the offer letter or the direct mail. Uh, I always tell my student, you have to mail at least three thousand mailers a month. That's a minimum, no lower. You don't want to try it for like 600 bucks mailers, right? Every single month, spend $3,000 or 3,000 mailers on a county, at least. That's a bare minimum. So it costs you money, it costs you time. If okay. you have that two commitments, you know, you'll make it work. Okay. Um, I wonder, do you have any like weird stories? Like usually this is a question for people who own actual buildings because people who own buildings always have weird stories. Um, are there any weird stories in land? Like what kind of strange transactions have you done, not done? Uh, not so much weird because, uh, you know, uh, normally with buildings, you have to deal with the tendon and the tendon inside is very weird, right? So, uh, but for land, sometimes the owner, they are in different type. Um, some owners are just super outgoing. They want, really want to talk to you. And some some guy just don't want to talk to you at all. I remember the, I, I closed a deal. Uh, I actually got so excited because he tried to sell it for 20 grand and that land worth about 60,000. So he lives in about Palm Coast, about two hours away from me. So I was so excited. I drive to his house. I knock his door until like my hand turns red. And he was inside. And the neighbor told me he is inside. He never opened the door. And he only comes out once at 1 a.m. in the morning. That's the one time. So I was like, should I come back at 1? And uh, I said, probably not. So the entire time we closed that deal, I never, ever talked to him. And the title agent never, ever talked to him. Everything was on the email. And she got, he got the the check even through the 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 mail. She, he never talked. I don't know. Uh, that was kind of weird. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's a great story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. I mean, for sure. Like, I guess there's like the less. Uh, you're right. The tenants are usually the weird part of the story and the real estate story. But sometimes the owners are a bit special too. So <laughs> it's <laughs> nice to hear that even land guys have those kind of situations. Um. So the last question of the interview is uh, just about you know, our industry and what do you think we should be talking about that we're not talking about? I mean, as far as the entire industry? Yeah. I mean, whatever, you know, you live in your niche of this industry, right? So you see one particular, um, you know, segment of things, but do you have a sense that there's something people should be talking about that they're not talking about? Uh, I think uh, it's just a lot of coaches I see try to make something that looks super easy. And, uh, they try to show off their cars, their watch, their their home, 
and uh, so kind of a, like a hook, right? Hook people in and look, see, if you do what I do, you'll be like this, right? But the thing is, they don't show what's the hard work behind it or what is required to become a person like him. So, you know, when, whenever I talk to my, my student, I always tell them, this is the minimum you have to do to get results. Don't, don't look at that result yet, but this is number one thing, number two thing, number three thing you have to do. So I think, you know, as a coach myself, I think uh, we have to let people know beforehand, before they buy your, your, your big ticket coaching program, you have to tell them, I want you to be something like this. And I, I want you to do something like this, right? So for me, my student have to be laser focused. I, I don't want, I don't, I don't care where you come from, but if you come in the program, do not look for everything else. I mean, there's no more houses, no more apartments, focus on this one, right? And we make it work together. And that's how, how I, how I see that. And, you know, everything, whatever you see, whoever get bigger results, you know, they, they pay a lot of more price behind the scene. Yeah, I think that speaks very much to, you know, your answer to the previous question about sacrificing, right? Is that like, the sh let go of the shiny object syndrome, fix on one particular thing, and then put in the work that's necessary. And I think, um, you know, it's actually funny, because like, I get the chance to ask a lot of people this question. And like, a lot of the times, it's the similar kind of answers that come back is that, like you said, a lot of, you know, coaches, a lot of people who are in the industry, even brokers are guilty of this, you know, will like show off, like you said, their lifestyle, the car, the house, um, the watch, whatever it is, uh, to kind of hook people in and make it look easy. But I mean, the truth is, if it was easy, everybody would do it. And it's not. So mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> um, well, look, right. thank you for spending this time, uh, you know, talk, telling my audience about what you do. What's the best way for people to get in touch with you if they want to learn more, if they want to reach out? Uh, I have an Instagram account. Uh, my my tag there is uh, the same as here, virtual flip land. So V-I-R-T-U-A-L flip land. So easy. Okay, super easy. Yeah. I know I'm going to go check that out when we get off. Um, Ray, thank you again for being with me. And uh, I'm wishing you good luck. Thank you, Terry, for having me.